Hello guys, um, welcome to um, the video for Chi-Square. Um, today, um, as it's snowing outside, um, and Winter Storm Easton has probably arrived, um, we are going to be learning how to apply Chi-Square um, to Mendelian genetics. Um, so we did Chi-Square, oh, let me go back. Um, we did Chi-Square um, a while ago, when well, I think maybe September, and it was actually on your midterm, and some of you complained that you didn't remember how to do it, um, where we had, we did it in our behavior analysis of fruit flies, um, where we had the fruit flies in a choice chamber. Um, we had two choices. We wanted to see if there was a preference. Did they prefer, let's say, chocolate over banana? And we put the fruit flies in the choice chamber, and we let them make a decision, and then we calculated our chi-square value. So um, let's say if they had no preference, we would the expected value um, would be that half would be at the banana and half would be at the chocolate. Um, but the purpose of chi-square was to see if you had 60-40, um, is that difference big enough to conclude that the fruit flies have a preference? Um, we're going to be applying chi-square to Mendelian genetics. Um, the purpose of chi-square in Mendelian genetics is to see if the offspring fit the mode of inheritance you're predicting. So let's say you think that the genes are sex-linked. Do the ratios of offspring fit what is predicted by the Punnett square close enough so that you can say that the trait is sex-linked? So this sort of just says chi-square is a goodness of fit test. Does the expected data, what we expect, fit what, we, what the data actually is or what you observe? Does the expected data fit close enough to what you observed to make to make your conclusion or your hypothesis too. Um, in chi-square we use a null hypothesis. Your null hypothesis for Mendelian genetics is essentially going to predict um, or state which form of inheritance you think the ratios of offspring um, match. Um, when we run a chi-square test our goal is either to reject um, or fail to reject the hypothesis. We do not accept the null hypothesis. You hear people say that and actually on uh, one of the tests on the AP exam they actually took off points for saying accept the null hypothesis. You never accept the null hypothesis. You fail to reject it. So as I said um, in genetics, and we need an S here, lame grammar, um, in genetics um, we're trying to see if the results that we see, the data, the number of offspring, are close enough to the ratios predicted by our Punnett square to assume that the, the form of inheritance that we think it is, is correct. Um, here is our um, chi-square formula. I've actually already written on it. Um, this number here, I'll rewrite it, is chi-square. That's what it stands for. This symbol means sum. Um, the observed value is the actual number of offspring on uh, each category. Um, the expected value is the amount predicted by the Punnett square. You subtract those two and square it, um, and then you divide that number by the expected value. And you do this for each category of offspring. Um, so for example, if you were crossing, um, let's say you had this, you thought their inheritance was this, um, so it follow, follows Mendelian laws, and if you did this cross, you would expect half to show the dominant trait, so half would be dominant, so I'm going to write half D, um, and half um, would show the recessive trait. That's what you would predict if it followed Mendelian inheritance. Um, let's say you got 60 showing the dominant trait and 40 showing the recessive trait. Okay, the question is, are those numbers close enough to the 50-50 split that you would, you would expect um, to conclude um, that the, that the um, offspring or the gene um, follows Mendelian Punnett square rules. Um, we're not going to do this, but you would actually calculate it would be 50 minus 60 squared, and then divided by 60, and you would get the value. And then 40 um, minus 50 squared divided by 40, you would add those two up, and that would be your chi-square value. Obviously, when we do the example, um, you'll be able to see this more closely. Okay. So as I wrote down here, degrees of freedom 
um, is the number of classes or the number of offspring off, offspring categories minus one. So in the example that I did before, you have two offspring classes minus one. So the degrees of freedom is one. Um, this is our chi-square table. It actually shows you what is known as the critical value. So the critical value. Um, when we're doing Mendelian genetics, we always use a p-value of 0.05. This tells you your level of confidence. So here, you, if you're using this value, you have 95% confidence um, in your data. Or, um, and um, the critical value with a, a um, with degrees of freedom of 1 is 3.84. If your chi-square value is larger, so if your chi-square value is larger than the critical value, the chi-square value is the one you calculate, um, you reject your null hypothesis. If it is smaller than the critical value on the table, you fail to reject um, your null hypothesis. Okay, so we are now going to go um, to smart board software um, and do the an example um, on uh, that I gave you on your sheet um, that has the snowman and the um, the penguin. Let me discard the ink annotations and let me bring up the smart pair software. Here it is. Okay, um, so I would actually recommend that as you um, as I work through this, that you write it down um, as as I'm doing it as well. Um, remember, this is counting as a quiz. Um, not so much you writing this down, but the other two questions that follow is counting as a quiz, so you must do it. I know some of you are like, Rah. I know I saw Spencer's face in class when I said this. Um, but, um, so I'm going to go through each step, so I'm going to try. I might end up typing some of it because it's hard. I'm having trouble writing with the mouse today, um, but we'll see. So the first step um, in any chi-square problem is to write your null hypothesis. So here in this problem, let me grab a pen, um, they want us to predict, or they want us to run a chi-square test to determine if the traits that we're following, um, I, color, in this new species of bug, and Harry Abenman. Um, do these traits follow Mendelian's law of independent assortment, and are not? And are, they, are they not influenced by environmental factors? So are these law, are these genes, are they strictly following Mendel's laws, or is something else, um, you know, it, at play here? They could be linked, which means they would violate um, Mendel's law of independent assortment. They could be affected by sun or temperature. Um, so maybe it's not following um, Mendel's laws. So the first step, and I've already wrote this because it's always wordy, um, is to write your null hypothesis. So in this case, on my null hypothesis, you can always write a, something like this: ratios of of ratios of observed ratios observed. Well, this is there's a typo here. So ratios observed. You don't need this of here. Or of offspring. Or whoa, typo. Alright, so let's let's fix this. Obviously this is good. So you could the you could actually fix this by saying um, ratio is observed or offspring ratio is observed um, follow Mendel's law of independent assortment and Mendelian inheritance. You could always use the same sort of starter and then just stick in the form of inheritance. So ratios of offspring observed um, follow Mendel's law of independent assortment. Um, and Mendelian inheritance. So that's the first step is to write your null hypothesis. You can keep the first sentence starter obviously corrected the same and just stick in the form of inheritance that you're um, hypothesizing. Okay, so the second step when you're doing your chi-square analysis is to calculate your expected values. And you do that by doing a Punnett square. So if you see here, we're crossing heterozygous, two, two organisms that are heterozygous for both traits. So we have greens, so we're going to use G. So we have G, G, and Harry will use H. H, H, times itself, because they're both heterozygous. Now, as I finish writing, you should remember that whenever you cross two offspring that are heterozygous for both traits, you get a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. 9 show both dominant traits. 3 show one dominant trait and one recessive trait. The other 3 show the reverse trait. So one is dominant, one is recessive for the other one. And then 1 is completely recessive. That's the expected ratios. 
Now we need to see, is this expected ratio that we expect from Mendelian inheritance close enough to the values up here? Okay, so to get our expected values, okay, we need to take the probability of each one and multiply it by the total amount of offspring. So if you add up the total amount of offspring, you'll see that they add up, you get a calculator out, I've done the cross already, you'll see that they add up to 560. Okay, and the probability of getting it showing both dominant traits is 9 out of 16. So 9 out of 16 times 560 equals 315. Okay, and that is the amount that we expect to show both dominant traits, which in this case is green and hairy. So I'm just going to write G slash H to save myself from having to write. That's the amount we expect to be green and hairy. Okay. Now, for um, the for green eyes and no hair, um, this one is dominant. This one is recessive. We expect 3 out of 16 times 560. Um, which is, if we take a look and I look at my numbers, 105. So that's the number we expect to be green and not hairy. So I'm going to write N, green and not hairy. Now I'm going to scroll down so I can um, fit in some more. Now for the other one, one how many are going to have red eyes and hair? So uh, red eyes is recessive and hair is dominant or hairy is dominant. So once again, that ratio is 3 out of 16 times 560. And that also equals 105. And that is the amount that are red and hairy. And the last, showing both recessive traits, is 1 out of 16 times 560 equals 35. And that is the number that are red with no hair. Okay, these numbers are your expected values. So step one is to write your null hypothesis. And then step two um, is to calculate your expected values using chi-square, I'm sorry, using your Punnett square. Now here we didn't have to do a Punnett square because we should know this ratio. You really need to know the ratio, this ratio. Sometimes you have to do a Punnett square if, if, the, if it's not an obvious ratio. I'm running out of time in this video because these videos can only be 15 minutes. Um, I'm at 13 minutes. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to upload this video. Um, and then we're going, in the second video, we're going to calculate our chi-square value. Um, which is the third step.